the idea for her to share her experience with MOOCs and the, the, the readings that she's been doing with MOOCs in a time that Penn State is just starting MOOCs. There's so much talk about MOOCs there at, at Penn State. So Vera is going to talk uh, for around 20 minutes. She'd like to have questions after that. So when I, I'm going to I'm going to go to the background, go in the background, and come back after the, after the presentation to to try to manage the questions with you and I have Vera here. So Vera, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. So Good morning. Me. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, as you know, I'm here to talk about MOOCs, and uh, you see that I start saying, do we need to, to spell it out? And uh, the reason is, uh, you know, it just seems that uh, there is so much hype today about uh, MOOCs. You know, you see, in fact, it's driving me absolutely insane every day when I think that, uh, you know, I more or less have everything figured out, or most of it. Uh, there is something new, including this morning, you know, like a, a new MOOC provider, and uh, maybe I'll talk about that uh, later. So, anyway, so we all know what MOOCs uh, means, you know, like a massive open online uh, courses, but still there are some people playing with uh, with the acronym. Uh, so, for instance, you know, we have here massive and often obtuse courses. And uh, even I came up with something with, uh, is it an obsessive compulsion? And, uh, or Machiavellian, obstreperous and opportunistic creatures. And uh, maybe it's some, you know, it's a suggestion more or less about how I feel. Yes, I do feel passionate about uh, the topic, but, uh, you know, I have some reservations and uh, we'll get there. So the agenda today, you know, I'm going to start with the New York Times video. It's not new. But uh, it gives you a very good overview of, uh, of what MOOCs are about, and uh, you know for sure, you know, doing a much better job than I would do about this overview. For some, it will be just a recap. For others, maybe something new uh, there. Uh, I will go through the the business model in terms of uh, how are the universities and uh, and the companies that uh, provide the MOOCs are. Uh, are dealing in terms of uh, monetizing it, you know, are they making money or not? I'm going through the, the positive points about the, the MOOCs, also the challenges, you know, like what are the problems that are they are facing, uh, and also the controversial uh, topic, the credit situation, and uh, also important, the overall perspective from, uh, you know, the faculty point of view. and. Uh, and in the end, I just go through some questions that are still, you know, important to be answered. And if we do have time, you know, I have some extra slides. But uh, so let's go with the video right now. Every few, Every few seconds, seconds the, ticker the ticker on the Coursera, on the Coursera website, website moves, moves up. up. As 70,000 70, new students, students a week enroll in, enroll courses, in courses like human-computer like interaction, interaction, introduction, introduction to, astronomy, to astronomy, and modern, and modern poetry, poetry, all offered, all offered by top-tier top -tier universities. universities. I've been teaching a class similar to this at Duke for 10 years, and I'm excited about the opportunity to offer it to many more students through this online venue. Welcome to the brave new world of massive open online courses, no known as MOOCs a tool for democratizing higher education. So welcome to the artificial intelligence class on Udacity. The MOOC is usually free, creditless, and massive. MOOCs first landed in the spotlight last year when Sebastian Thrun, a Stanford professor, offered a free artificial intelligence course, attracting 160,000 students in 190 nations. Although only a fraction of students who sign up actually complete the courses, millions of students are now enrolled in hundreds of online courses, including those offered by Udacity, Mr. Thrun's spin-off company, edX, a joint venture between Harvard and MIT, and Coursera, a Stanford spin-off that has attracted top universities like Princeton, Columbia, Duke, and University of Pennsylvania. We're in the business of creating and disseminating knowledge. And in 2012, the internet is an incredibly important place to be present if you're in the knowledge dissemination business. 
One of the first MOOCs the university developed is called Healthcare Policy and the Affordable Care Act, taught by Dr. Ezekiel J. Emanuel, a former health advisor to the White House Office of Management and Budget. There's nothing like watching yourself on video to realize how boring and stilted you can be. So far, most MOOCs are in tech subjects like computer science and math, with straightforward content that could be graded by a computer. Providing instructor connection and feedback in courses like Dr. Emanuel's is tricky. The student who's not in the class can't ask me a question directly <laughs> in real time. And we can't go off on some path that might be very important to understanding uh, certain subtleties or complexities of uh, the course. It's funny that people get really worked up about the grade. People want to feel like, you know, they're being acknowledged for the amount of effort they're putting in. So let's talk about access to health care in the United States. Although Coursera's founders want to keep courses like Dr. Emanuel's free of charge, they acknowledge they'll have to monetize to run the company, send money to partner universities, and pay back investors, who have put some $22 million in venture capital into Coursera. I think the part of what's key here, and I think part of what Coursera has gotten right, is it makes more sense to build your user base first, and then figure out later how to monetize it, than to worry too much at the beginning about monetization. Most education experts predict that the main source of revenue for MOOC providers will be licensing its courses for a fee, as a course in a box that can be used by community colleges or other institutions. Welcome to Calculus. At University of Pennsylvania, there are high hopes for a single variable calculus course starting in January, taught by Professor Robert Grist using his own hand-drawn animations. Look, this is, you know, the Wild West. We're just learning. I mean, we're just, we're just at, you know, at the start. Okay, so as you see, you know, they're, one of the, the points that they are making in, in the video is that uh, they have to figure out ways to, to, to make money. And uh, it looks like Coursera is starting to make money. At least in the, in the first quarter, you see that they made not much, but still 220000 um, because they're offering this program called Signature Track, and they give um, awards for students who are willing to pay $50 for the certificate. And, uh, and they suggest that, uh, you know, what you can do is you, you just put in your resume on the professional development that you've taken this MOOC. And, uh, and Daphne Collar, uh, one of the founders of Coursera, you know, she's talking about, you know, you know we have to, 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 to understand here that we have about 80% of the uh, students who are paying for, for the, the, the certificates, they do finish the, the courses because there, there's, you know, this big uh, talk about, oh, we have 90% of attrition. And it all depends on the, the student intent. So it could be very well that uh, I am taking a MOOC just because I want to see what it is about or I want to exchange uh, knowledge with other people, but uh, I have no intention in uh, getting a certificate or taking a final quiz or writing a final paper. So, but still, you know, like I say, it's still a gamble. And uh, so what are ways that they are thinking about uh, and making some money? Okay, so it could be that, uh, oh, we, uh, we have potentially, you know, uh, we have tuition payers because we, we get students encouraged after they take the, the first MOOC and then they will uh, apply to our university. Uh, another way is not to make money, but maybe perhaps to save money is to get some alumni to, to serve as TAs. Um, also, you can refer students to booksellers, which is something that, uh, you know, uh, Coursera is doing with Amazon.com. So if students uh, buy books suggested by the professors, you know, uh, they, get, they get some of it. Uh, they can make money uh, with partnering with employers, you know, like finding the, the, the star students and maybe they will become star employees for, for these employers. You know, after they, they pay a fee, um, obviously fees for certificates and then licensing MOOCs because there are lots of uh, you know small colleges, especially that uh, you know they cannot provide the MOOCs, but uh, they can license them and uh, offer to to some students. 
uh, selling books for corporate use, yes, you know, like the training for employees, and also, you know, the assignment marking. Uh, for instance, with Coursera, you have the, the peer uh, marking, which is something to, that, uh, you know, turns off many people. You know, how do I know that, uh, you know, this peer is, uh, you know, uh, has any knowledge, you know, any preparation in order to, to look at my, at my work? So I want a professor or a TA to look at my work, so I'm paying for it. So, okay, and the pros, uh, you know, uh, lower costs for higher and continuing ed students. And why is that? Well, because of the competition. You know, if I am going, you know, if I can take a, a MOOC instead of uh, paying for a continuing education course, you know, like, uh, well, obviously I'm going to take a MOOC. So there is a lot of competition there. So let's lower the price because we can still attract students to, to, to small colleges, for example. Um, it's open to anyone. And uh, also, you know, it's great that I can exchange knowledge with everybody in the world, you know, get new perspectives. You know, I can uh, take MOOCs from the best professors of the best universities, and I can also, you know, uh, see um, uh, guest speakers uh, talking, very interesting people. And uh, it's low cost for universi universities that offer them. It's, uh, it's expensive in the beginning to produce them, but once they, they they pass the, the, the first course, you know, they, then it's okay for them. You, basically, they don't have to spend much on that. And that they also can complement face-to-face course, which is what they call the, the inverted or flipped uh, classroom, that some professors ask students to, to go home and, and uh, attend uh, class, the, the MOOC, and then come back to school, and then they have good discussions. So, but there's a phobia. You know, and they're saying, oh, it's McDonald's, you know, in education. It's fat, fat, cheap, but, uh, you know, not much substance uh, there. They're also saying that uh, they're taking away, you know, the, the, the star professors, you know, because they cannot do everything and, uh, and do the lectures that the, the, traditionally speaking. So they're taking them away, so they're getting adjuncts to teach the, the courses. And uh, it's still talking about, oh, still there's uh, still the elitism. You know, uh, because of those who can afford going to uh, real university, they will still go to the elite schools or where the other people will just take them for free. So, and then, okay, the universities, like I said, you know, like uh, it's complicated in the beginning, time consuming. Uh, it's uh, a huge problem, plagiarism, how you're going to prove that uh, that student uh, that is taking the uh, the, the last quiz is, you know, who they are saying they are. Um, a faculty, they do not have uh, lots of time, you know, like, uh, what are we going to do? Take them away from research or even uh, supervising graduate students because now they have to focus on the MOOCs. Uh, and then you have, yes, the, the, the resentment from tuition paying students, you know, that uh, students who say, you know, I do not want to to be exchanging ideas with people that uh, are not paying for the course. I don't know the caliber of participants that you have there. So I just want to, you know, if I'm paying, I want differentiated uh, services here. And, uh, and also for a library negotiating uh, course materials. For the small colleges, yeah, you know, like I said, you know, like, uh, why am I going to take a continuing ed course if I can take a MOOC? So there's a disadvantage there for them, and they cannot offer, they cannot create the MOOCs themselves because it's expensive, and if they want, they have to spend money in order to, to get the license to, to offer them. For the students, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, for, for the, the professors, you know, the, the number of students, uh, you know, just like a, how can I motivate them? I want to talk to the students, for instance, you know, like a, I am an online instructor and usually, you know, like I have a 20 people in my classes and I, I love the interaction, you know, with the students. And when you have thousands, you absolutely, you can't do that. So, and you cannot exchange ideas in real time. And like I said, it takes uh, professors away from other activities. And some professors have expressed, you know, like a really, like a real disappointment when they see the, the quality of uh, the, the questions and the comments that they get from, from the students. 
And for other students, you know, like you have problems with time zone and language barriers, uh, technology problems, you know, like a maybe lack of skills. I don't know how to uh, use Twitter or Facebook or blog or, or even uh, in terms of um, bandwidth capacity. And it's extremely overwhelming. You see, you know, tons of messages coming and going and uh, you just, you don't know where to look, what's important. And, uh, and also, you know, yes, big problem. You know, most of the, the MOOCs, most of these courses, they, we still don't get credit for them, okay? And the peer grading that I talked before. So, you know, in terms of the, the credit situation, uh, they say, oh, don't worry, credit's on its way. And, uh, you know, also because uh, it, it's a good thing if we, if we you just start giving credits because then uh, uh, we are going to attract more people and boost enrollment. And uh, in fact, you see that uh, the ACE, they have endorsed five Coursera courses uh, lately. But, uh, but still, you know, there's a, a survey, a recent survey by the Chronicle of uh, Higher Education, you know, 72% of professors, they say, you know, even if I'm teaching the MOOC, I still don't believe in giving credit for the course. And, um, and also, you know, a problem with, uh, you know, uh, students taking MOOCs from other universities and coming to your university and saying, well, I, I want credit for it, you know, you have to give it. So it's just like, a, it's still kind of really messy. So then, uh, important, the faculty's perspective, you know, like, and I'm saying, you know, some are saying, oh, MOOCs is a step backward, because if we've been trying to figure out, you know, the best pedagogical ways of, uh, of teaching and, and, you know, Many are saying, you know, lectures don't work, and now you're, you're talking about uh, video lectures. So it's not even that, that, that students can ask questions, you know, because uh, it's just a, a one-way uh, conversation. And others say, you know, great education is when you exchange ideas with students and students with students. But uh, it's just getting from a computer or watching a video, that's not education. But still, you, you have other faculty, you know, that, that they, they say, well, there are good things, you know, we can do lots of it, be really creative with technology. Uh, I try to make my MOOCs as challenging as I, as I make my, my traditional courses, uh, and, uh, which creates some rage in the, the traditional students. And, uh, and also some, you know, they, they think that it should really become part of mainstream education. Like I said, you know, some see good value in this flipped uh, classroom model. And then I had here, you know, but why do they do it? Why do faculty do it? And uh, it was funny because, you know, like lots of papers that I've been reading, they say, okay, oh, it's about, it's so altruistic. It's about the students, you know, it's democracy. Everybody has access uh, to education. But, uh, you know, but then you see that, no, it's about the professors, and I'm not saying it's all the professors think like that, but many are just in love with the fact that uh, they can become stars and become celebrities, you know. So it's uh, what I'm saying, so no professor left behind, you know, like, uh, I, oh, it's my, my colleague is doing, okay, I am doing too, and I'm going to prove that uh, I'm even better, that uh, I'm going to be so popular, you know, I'm going to be you know, rate my professors with great stars, and, uh, and now even you have a new site called uh, Grade My Courses that uh, was created for uh, the MOOCs. Uh, and then, yes, visibility, you know, and uh, um, I can also, you know, I can profit because I can sell my textbooks, you know, like when I'm teaching a MOOC. And, uh, and some even say that, uh, you know, maybe because I'm visible, you know, and very popular, maybe it's my way to gain uh, tenure. So, and then, that leaves us with a, a few questions, and um, so you know, and they revolve around financing, you know, and the quality assurance, and most important, this credit situation, this big controversy, and uh, and also about okay, we're talking about educating pe uh, people more efficiently, but uh, can we really educate them more effectively? So that's a big question. And also the big issues that uh, the, the MOOCs bring to the table, you know, the, the growth of tuition, you know, is it really worth paying tuition? Uh, the role of the professor, is the professor going to be a lecturer? Is it going to be just a facilitator? Many don't like to be uh, just facilitators. You know, the definition of student, 
and, and so on. And uh, so basically, uh, you know, I'll stop here so we, we can just talk so it's not a, like a MOOC, a one-way conversation, okay? Uh, okay, so I'll start with the questions here. Are MOOCs a U.S. phenomenon or do they have international traction as well? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, from all these papers that I've been reading, it's still, you know, offered by uh, U.S. companies like uh, Coursera, you know, like uh, with uh, Stanford and uh, Harvard, MIT. Uh, so pretty much focused here, but you still you have tons of students coming from other places uh, in the world. Okay, boosts quality and productivity of teaching in general. Uh, the quality, because some professors now, they are taking the MOOCs themselves and uh, because they want to learn from uh, their peers. And what are they doing? What, does it, what works when they teach? What makes them so popular? So I'm going to get the ideas and I am going to, to teach uh, using those ideas. Do we see issues of lost opportunity costs when investing in MOOCs? Hmm. Loss opportunity costs. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think that uh, um, right now, you know, there is, you know, you, you have uh, universities such as uh, Yale and uh, Carnegie Mellon that they are very hesitant. You know, they, they say we, 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 we still, we have an online uh, education side of our uh, institution, but uh, we do not want to, to invest in MOOCs because we still don't know. We're kind of uh, leery about it. So uh, really, I don't know. Maybe they're thinking that maybe we're going to be left behind this and it's going to be a lost opportunity. But right now, they think that, uh, you know, they still want to see what is going to happen. And some say that, uh, you know, MOOC is just a fad, you know, that uh, we're getting into something that is even better. And actually, I have something here recently that um, it says that um, future histories of education will likely only note MOOCs as, a, you know, a transitional step into an educational model that is organized around learning. So many people still don't believe it. And, I, and actually, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you, you know, my own experience. I've been taking MOOCs because I'm curious, obviously. And, uh, and to me, up to, you know, I'm taking a MOOC right now, but up to the, 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 the previous one that I, that I took, you know, maybe seven, six MOOCs, I absolutely hated them uh, with a passion because, uh, you know, like I said, you know, I teach online and I think uh, uh, it doesn't work. You know, you don't have interaction. What is the pleasure there? And, uh, and also, and I was seeing it as a, um, as a student um, that I was uh, posting some comments and questions and nobody would um, address them. And, uh, and my question was, uh, which was actually something that I raised with somebody before, that I thought, you know, like, it really uh, touches your, your self-esteem because you think, is it, what I am writing, is it so uh, uninteresting, you know, so stupid that nobody cares about answering me? So it's really, sometimes it's, it's a big turnoff. I know I've written some blogs in which I, I say, you know, like, uh, what about this, uh, 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 what I call democracy, you know, of education? Does it really work? You know, to me, it just sounds like, uh, you know, there's so much hype and, uh, you know, it, it just sounds like a the brave new world. Like, um, you know, they're saying that um, Thomas uh, Friedman of New York Times, you know, like uh, he, he hypes it so much. He thinks it's such a great thing for everybody. But uh, is it really? You know, I am not sure, but, but like I said, you know, until last course, I was totally against it. And then I started taking a course right now that uh, perhaps because I'm really interested because it's part of my, um, 
dissertation topic, which is uh, students with uh, cognitive uh, disabilities or ADHD, that, uh, you know, maybe I'm really interested, but still, you know, and I'm being exchanging thoughts with lots of people in this course, and, uh, but I'm thinking, is it because of the MOOCs, really? Or, you know, couldn't this be happening in a, any um, website in, in which we, we are talking like a, the ADHD Association, you know, site that I could be uh, exchanging ideas with them? I don't know if it's about the MOOCs. Vera, um, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So this is Larry Reagan. Um, I wanted to go back to your comment about the, um, the, the transition, that perhaps MOOCs are a uh, transitional process or a transitional phase for us to go into, as you said, a, um, the, the, the article commented on something perhaps that is different than what we know today. Um, do you have any insights or anything from what you're seeing as to the, that might describe how MOOCs are uh, integrated into higher education, where they might fit, how they might uh, play a role in higher ed? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I really think that uh, what we are getting to is the, the hybrid mode. Uh, because in my view, that's the best way to, to educate uh, people. Yes, uh, you know, they can do, you know, uh, from wherever they want, at any time they want, and they review the, the, the lectures, but then they go back to, to school and then there's the face-to-face -face contact, which to me is key in education. But also, you know, something that, uh, you know, from this morning, you know, there's a new platform called uh, Novo Ed, you know, it's also, you know, by a, a Stanford professor. And one of the things that he's saying here that, uh, you know, that his platform is different from the MOOCs, they are offering MOOCs, but they want to emphasize teamwork. And uh, that's where they think that uh, uh, we're heading uh, to now, because uh, they think that uh, with MOOCs, yeah, you talk to everybody, but at the same time, you're very isolated. And instead, you know, what you have to create is, is, is the means for people to, to do some uh, teamwork. You have to have teamwork in mind. Uh, to tell you the truth, you know, uh, the article that I saw today, you know, it doesn't give you many details, so I cannot tell you how they can do that, you know, what it would be different, because they say here that uh, they, um, what, what they have is students the students form groups at the beginning of each course and they conduct class discussions by messaging one another or in discussion boards under an assignment and then they evaluate their peers' uh, performance. Uh, seriously, uh, I don't see much uh, of a difference. Okay, so maybe because you're going to evaluate other people because they're your teammates, but, but still, uh, I don't know. So, uh, like I was saying, I think that's uh, where we are heading, that people are seeing the, the real value is in the flipped classroom. And this is not only universities, but, uh, you know, high schools uh, in which, uh, you know, the, the teachers are asking students to go and take a MOOC, you know, and then we come back here and we discuss. And not only that, you know, some professors are seeing the value that, uh, that they get and that they can offer to the, to the student uh, when they, they have some time left uh, to provide students with customized feedback. And uh, so it's more engaging for the students and for the professors because the lectures, you know, at least they say that most of them are boring. In fact, there's one research that I was looking at that they're saying that uh, students, undergrad students uh, taking lectures, uh, they measure their um, brain activity. And uh, apparently it's the equivalent as uh, them watching TV, you know, when they're watching lectures. So they're really not engaged. So I'm not sure if this answers your question. Thank you, Vera. That's, that's very interesting, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, 
in the sense that this is a uh, we're just at the very beginning of this uh, transformation and uh, MOOCs I think are creating the energy and, and some of the excitement and and they're um, they're going to also attract uh, some of the negative comments as well but but as people get creative with MOOCs we'll see that uh, morph into uh, some more dynamic kinds of um, environments so uh, thank you for those comments yeah, uh, I I think that uh, MOOC, uh, MOOCs actually um, there's a lot of um, you know research in, into the emotions that students bring to online education. Now I think that uh, at least from my uh, personal perspective, you know I had lots of emotions when I was uh, taking a few MOOCs. You know, like I was enraged, you know, by the fact that uh, nobody. Uh, would address uh, what I had to say or uh, what happened in one of the MOOCs that was canceled uh, um, because uh, ironically it, it was a MOOC about online teaching, the best ways of online teaching, uh, that it just became such a mess that everybody was working on the same document using uh, Google Docs that uh, they crashed the system. and. Uh, and uh, the professor apparently lost control over what was going on, and pe people were infuriated, and it became it became a, a joke. So there's a lot of uh, preparation that that, uh, and, and also you know in terms of capacity, you know you have to make sure that uh, you know how are we going to do this? Are we going to let you know like a ten thousand people? To, to just, just uh, self-organize and then uh, they will be working on a document. What if I have 500 people working on a document? It's just a mess. And I live that, you know, writing on a document and then somebody, as, a, as I write, you know, somebody is erasing what I'm saying and, and just typing something else. It's just like, a, it's insane and uh, really chaotic. And uh, and yes, it's great. You know, like uh, you learn so many uh, perspectives. You know, so, right now I'm sorry. Sorry, this is Kyle. I, I was going to uh, <clears throat> jump in with a follow-up question. <clears throat> so it seems like you know you're talking about some bad experiences in MOOCs, and and uh, I see MOOCs as disruptive innovations, which which are by nature start out as inferior, but then very rapidly they get better. And I'm seeing things like uh, Piazza.com, which I, I mentioned uh, in one of my questions, which is a place where you know it's for a question. It's a question answer system where students can support each other. Instructors can go in and validate questions. Every question is asked as sort of as a wiki that people can modify. Every answer is a wiki, and then within it now, we just I just right before this I got a demo, and uh, they've added the ability to create groups and have students enroll in groups. And I think the key will be creating a smallness within some of this. But I guess my what I want to hear you talk about is, so the state of MOOCs today is what it is. And there are some great ones, <clears throat> just like courses and face-to-face -face courses. There's some great ones and there are some disasters. <clears throat> but you know, what do you see? Um, you mentioned a hybrid MOOC. Uh, you know, have you thought about universities in which some of the basic content is delivered through MOOCs, where you know having somebody evaluate my you know higher order thinking isn't necessarily the goal, but you know do you see a role for MOOCs in sort of conveying some of the basic content and reducing the time to completion of degrees, or do you see a sort of a hybrid university instead of a hybrid MOOC? Yes, actually, I was uh, attending a webinar uh, yesterday with the um, University of uh, Wisconsin at La Crosse. And uh, and and they were talking about uh, um, a math course that they offer to students who are entering in the undergrad uh, education world. And uh, so what happens is that uh, the students uh, they learn math. And I actually I took some notes here, and uh, and they say that. Uh, they avoid the need for the students to take a credit course uh, when, when they, they, they start the program. So basically, you know, they don't have to take one extra course because they don't have the, the math 
uh, preparation that they need uh, to, to continue with the program. So they take that uh, MOOC, so they learn quite a lot according to, to their um, pilot, and, uh, and then they're into university mode. So that could be a good preparation. And, and that also, you know, there's a, when we talk about the, the profile of the student, in fact, there are lots of uh, high school students uh, taking MOOCs because uh, they, uh, not only because they, they want to, to gain more knowledge uh, for whatever they are doing, you know, what they're working on in high school, but also because they want to get a good uh, foundation to, in order to begin uh, university life. So I see MOOCs really working a lot like that. And, um, and also there's an, an allergy, analogy here, because you were talking about, you know, like, a, you, know, you know, everything that uh, is an innovation, you know, obviously, you know, you have some uh, stories of su success and, uh, and failure. And I would like to just to share with you uh, one quote here that I thought it was, it was great. Because they say, uh, the recording industry said, Alanis Morissette has just recorded three great songs. However, you need to buy the entire CD. But then Napster comes and says, hey, you only want the three songs? Sure, go ahead and get them. So they sold on the inconvenience, inconvenience of uh, going to a record store uh, to buy the record. So you buy just the ones you want. So And, and what they are saying is that MOOCs are the MP3 of education. And uh, Napster is Udacity or Coursera, you know. So basically, you know, they're uh, allowing you uh, to go and take courses that you really, uh, you're really interested in, and, and not that you have to take the whole program, you know, in order to to, to learn. So great, thank you I very much. That that, that, actually, I think that, that there's a more about. MOOCs allow you to, to learn for the sake of learning. You know, it's because of uh, whatever you're interested in. And I think that's really a, the beauty of it. So one, I guess a follow-up to my follow-up, and then I'll be quiet. The, the, uh, you mentioned that professors, even who teach MOOCs, are, don't really favor giving credit for MOOCs. But what do you think about, uh, so credit by examination, credit by portfolio following a MOOC? The whole, it looks like the prior learning assessment uh, field is really, and, and interest is really peaked in prior learning assessment. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that I could put a course online and I would be opposed to somebody who can actually pass the same examination or submit a portfolio that competes with my resident students. Uh, it seems to me that it would be difficult for me to object to giving credit in that kind of a circumstance. Do you have thoughts on prior learning assessment? Yes, and and actually, uh, it reminds me. Um, there's so one. Uh, I'm not gonna look for it now, but I, I know that there's one uh, university that uh, what they are thinking is actually, you know, thinking, you know, taking MOOCs as uh, proof of prior uh, learning. So what we're going to do is we're going to test the students, you know, and uh, and see how they do in this exam in order to to be accepted. And it doesn't matter where they gathered the, 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 the knowledge. So it could be, you know, like homeschool or, you know, MOOCs or, you know, somebody told them on the street. It doesn't matter. As long as they know, you know, that's fine. So, and MOOCs could serve like that. And, and it actually reminds me uh, a lot about the, the, the Brazilian system because I am from Brazil. And uh, we have something, because in, in North America, we have the system that uh, in order to, to, to go to university, uh, you have to be accepted according to, to your history uh, in, in high school. So they basically, you, you, they look at your grades, or at least more in Canada, uh, you know, they look at your grades in high school and they okay, this is a good student, let's accept the student. Uh, whereas in Brazil, it's just like, a, I could pretty much you know, like a, just breeze through, you know, high school, you know, like just getting passing grades. But then we have a preparatory, like the exam the, with the prior assessment. 
And uh, as long as I prove that uh, you know I can take that exam and I do well, it doesn't matter if I was a mediocre student before. You know what matters is the knowledge that I bring with me now. Thank you. I'm kind of lost here now. I don't know if there are more questions or comments. Vera, I'm wondering if you could um, speak some to the excitement that uh, MOOCs are creating, certainly here on our campus. Uh, we're seeing faculty members who have uh, perhaps not been involved in online learning before, and um, staff members, uh, you know, instructional designers and multimedia folks who have been, typically. Uh, there's just a whole new level of energy and excitement around this, um, this format. And I've been trying to sort through why is that? What is it about this environment that is so enticing and so um, different for faculty in particular? that they are really just, uh, they want to be involved. Um, they're putting the time and the energy and the interest into creating these uh, kind of events. Um, what is it, do you think, that stokes that passion? I'm curious about that. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, what is encouraging them right now is, uh, you know, what they see out there, you know, that uh, today, you know, like uh, you have kids, you know, like uh, babies being born with computers in their hands. Uh, you know, that's the language that they, they understand, you know, like uh, you just, uh, you have professors who, who, who go to, to the classroom and they ask students to uh, tweet uh, their questions or comments, you know, and then um, because that's a way that, uh, that this, the new generation, you know, that, that they understand how to communicate, it's, it's intuitive. So I think that there, when I said that uh, no professor left behind, I think that has a lot of uh, influence in how faculty are feeling right now. Some are, are pretty innovative, really, that they, they love the technology and they love to experiment. So yeah, so we have a new way of teaching. OK, I'm in. But uh, other professors are really like, a, well, wait a second. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to be the dinosaur here. And uh, my colleagues are doing. And I have you know, my colleague who's uh, who's become a, a celebrity in South Korea because of when uh, students there, they, they see this professor in, in the lecture, in the video lecture, he's uh, apparently wearing some red shoes or something and became famous. And so he went to Korea and he had to, to wear the shoes because that's his trademark. So it's a really, uh, and I actually, I have a video here, uh, if you're interested, that I thought uh, it pretty much tells you um, this celebrity uh, mode, you know, like how, how they feel about it, uh, that they don't want to be left behind. And this is by Dan Ariely of Duke uh, University. And uh, see how he, uh, he markets uh, his MOOC.
in a valiant attempt to locate his elusive students, Dan Ariely stumbled upon a revolution in pedagogy. A movement so daring, so maniacal, that college professors everywhere are shaking in their boots. Join Dan Ariely, best-selling author and famed behavioral economist, notorious for his unerring judgment and fervor for experimentation, professor of A Beginner's Guide to Irrational Behavior, as he boldly takes on the world of massively open online courses, stunning a world of students one by one. Embark on this action-packed journey with Dan as he channels the heroic powers of scientific inquiry and glares into the eyes of skeptics and zealots alike. Learn to harness the quirks of the human mind with relentless enthusiasm and discover why we behave in the farcical ways that we do. The arbitrary nature of our decisions, the absurdity of our minds on money, our ability to rationalize even the most preposterous actions, how labor leads to love and even how our loins can override better judgment. This is no hyperbole. Only Dan Ariely himself could tell the riveting story of human irrationality. Sign up now. So as you can see, you know, like uh, they're having fun, you know, which is great, you know, like, but uh, it is a way like to take my MOOC, you know, like, uh, it, it is about uh, you know celebrity, yes, uh, and uh, and there's not nothing wrong with that, you know. Like uh, if, if that's the way, you know. And I'm seeing a comment here that uh, um, that uh, many professors, uh, you know, they're they're inspired because uh, you know that they can serve more students. And absolutely, you know, there are uh, you know lots of professors who think that uh, this is fantastic. We can you know, just reach so many students who otherwise uh, would not be able to, 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 to get to school, you know. So, but, you know, as you see, you know, there, there's been some rivalry now, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm going to make my MOOC more interesting and, uh, and, and some are marketing your courses is like brilliantly, I would say. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Vera, I have just one more, and then I'll promise I'll stop. Um, are you? Um, did I understand that you're working on your PhD in this area? Yes. Could, could you I tell am, us a little bit about your study? Yes. What I am doing is I am linking. Uh, the experience, uh, online uh, experience of students. Uh, but what I am doing is the experience of uh, students with ADHD uh, and uh, actually more mature students. And when I say mature, it's not the 25-year-olds. I'm talking about the 40-year-olds and up uh, with ADHD and how they uh, perform uh, their experiences in online learning, but specifically now, you know, I want to link it to, to MOOCs because, uh, like I said, you know, like I am a baby boomer and, uh, and I was, uh, and my experience with, with MOOCs was just like, wow, well, is, this, is this because I'm so overwhelmed because um, I, I was simply, you know, I was born in a, in, in, at a time that uh, obviously there were no uh, computers or is it because of uh, the fact that uh, I myself, I have ADHD? And uh, so I'm interested in both sides and also because you know, I have this passion you know, for teaching for so long in, uh, uh, online. And, uh, and because I, I do believe in this uh, clear interaction with students and uh, uh, giving feedback and uh, to students, you know, like I really creating a connection, you know, like a, um, and, and with MOOCs to me, it seems so impersonal, you know, like, a, you know, the professor, you know, like, a, uh, if you get an answer by the, the TA, uh, maybe, oh, that's great, you know, you've got an answer, but uh, if by any chance you get a comment from the professor, uh, then I just like, I, you just hit the, the jackpot, you know, but so I'm trying basically to, to uh, marry both things. It's just like a cognitive disabilities 
and uh, you know the experience of students uh, online, but especially in an overwhelming environment with lots of uh, noise, you know, chaos, you know, like uh, you know how the students perform if they 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 get to to the end if they become discouraged and think you know this is not for me because there's too much noise because this is you know one of the aspects of uh, ADHD is like uh, the ability the inability to actually focus properly on something especially if you have so many distractions so I'm not sure if that you know if it makes sense you know but I'm, I'm getting there uh, we, we'd certainly like to hear back from you in uh, in a little while and uh, understand more about how your project uh, progressed because I think you're talking about addressing a target population that uh, can greatly benefit from these environments and we'd love to hear about the results so good luck to you. Thank you. Vera, there's one more question there from Herbert. Um, if you see about, uh, he's talking about MP3s. He says yeah. they're mostly freely available. Um, Apple's invented iTunes. Could you comment on that, uh, on his question there? I guess uh, my understanding is that you're talking about, so it's okay, so maybe, you know, there will be some MOOCs that uh, will be, um, you have to pay uh, to get them. Uh, it could be, but again, you know, like uh, we're gonna be, we're gonna have again the same great divide, you know, like uh, yes, okay, uh, I, I'm not sure about the quality, uh, about uh, you know, my understanding is because uh, when I get my my music, I get from iTunes, so I pay for them, but. Uh, I, my understanding is that the quality may, may not be the same. So I'm figuring here maybe that uh, you know the analogy would serve here that uh, maybe uh, the students would take uh, would pay for MOOCs, uh, maybe would get perhaps a, a smaller uh, student population, so the ability to to be more interactive and maybe even exchange thoughts with uh, the professor or have the, their assignments uh, marked by prof by the professors uh, it, it could be um, I just um, I think it's inevitable you know like at, at some point somebody is going to find a way to uh, charge for MOOCs and uh, it's going to be the you know they, they are trying to think of other ways of not charging for MOOCs but you see you know like a when they are charging for the certificates, because they, they do have to, to make money somewhere, you know, so they think, okay, so we're going to charge. But uh, Andrew Ng of um, Coursera, he's actually trying to find a way to uh, subsidize the students who cannot pay for the certificates in a way they're going to try to find a way that they can subsidize that. But still, you know, it's not concrete. That, we still don't know what's going to happen, but uh, my feeling is that uh, it's not going to be, it may be free, but uh, not all of them. I think there, there's going to be some kind of difference at some point. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, it's what I'm saying. I think that uh, if you want uh, uh, differentiated, uh, you know. Uh, seriously, I think that with the experience that I said that I uh, that I was so negative, at some point I would pay a fee just to get uh, validation. Actually, because that's what I was looking for, you know, for what I was saying, you know, like I even if I, what I'm saying is nonsense, at least I want somebody to tell me this is nonsense, you know. But uh, the silent treatment is, is awful, and I would have paid for it. So here we have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, maybe you can do a, a, a exercise in futurology and, and tell us just to wrap up what, where you think MOOCs are going. Well, uh, 
uh, like I said, I think that uh, it, it, you know MOOCs are uh, maybe that's just a, like a, a matter of semantics here. You know, maybe they will not be MOOCs anymore. But uh, I think that the idea of having students uh, take some courses, you know, or most courses online, you know, uh, the lectures and going through the materials and uh, and going back to the traditional environment in school to to have a, a real face-to-face uh, -face conversation uh, with the professors. I think this is where we're still going. I, I'm a strong believer that uh, uh, we need uh, human interaction face-to-face. -face. No matter what, we can be, you know, 100 years from now, I think that the, as humans, uh, we crave for that connection. And I think that uh, we're still going to to have traditional universities. And also because, you know, like uh, um, many of the, the people like uh, who are against uh, online education and uh, they, they defend the, the traditional education is because of the experience. It's not only about the knowledge that you gain, it's about the experience that you gain. Uh, somebody said, uh, you know, when you send your kid to, 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 to school, what actually is happening is that uh, they, they go to school as teenagers and they come back as adults. And, and it's all about the experience. You know, it's all about the, the exchanges that they get uh, with other people. So I think that uh, MOOCs, yes, will still exist. And uh, online learning is here to stay, absolutely. You know, and uh, like it or not, you know, it's, it's actually one of the, the big bones that I have, you know, with uh, with some people at um, U of T, at OISE, like uh, some are very resistant to online education. You, you talk about online education, it's just like, a, oh, no, let's not talk about it. It's not, you know, no matter what you think, you have to face it. It's here. It, it will stay. OK. So I'd like to thank Vera and thanks, everybody, for the questions and the participation. So the session was recorded, so if you got in late or you can share you can share the the link with others. So again, once more, thank you much. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you. I think it was a great presentation, a very good discussion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for your participation. Bye.